Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The origin of herbivory in the Carboniferous was a landmark event in the evolution of terrestrial ecosystems, increasing ecological diversity in animals, but also giving them greater influence on the evolution of land plants. Although the period is often associated with vast areas of tropical coal swamps, with many tetrapods remaining aquatic or semi-aquatic, the Carboniferous also saw the establishment of the first fully terrestrial vertebrates, which were able to spend much of their lives on land. Like modern amphibians, ancestral tetrapods were largely carnivorous, feeding on invertebrates, fish, and other smaller vertebrates, with most needing to return to the water in order to lay their eggs. However, the emergence of the amniotes changed all this, representing a major step towards severing the connection with water for good, and leading to the diverse radiations that would give rise to the mammals and reptiles, which also includes the birds. Amniotes can be distinguished from the other living tetrapod clade, the non-amniote lysamphibians, by the development of three membranes that surround the egg, with these being the amnion for embryonic protection, the chorion for gas exchange, and the allantois for metabolic waste disposal or storage. The presence of this buffer around the egg, in combination with the development of thicker, keratinized, water-impermeable skin, a robust air-breathing form of respiration involving the expanding and contracting of the rib cage, and the presence of an astragalus bone in the ankle, meant that amniotes could thrive in drier, fully terrestrial ecosystems. Because the amnion and the fluid it secretes shields the embryo from environmental fluctuations, amniotes can reproduce on dry land by either laying shelled eggs, such as in reptiles, birds and monotremes, or nurturing fertilized eggs within the mother, as in marsupial and placental mammals. The first amniotes evolved from the so-called reptilomorph amphibians, which are a great example of a wastebasket clade, representing a mishmash of different tetrapods that may be quite distantly related to each other. Many of these would make perfect subjects for future videos, given how strange and obscure some of them were, as well as their constantly shifting nightmare of a taxonomy. Regardless, the first amniotes would have resembled small lizards, with it once being thought that these animals emerged during the Middle Carboniferous, given that the oldest fossil remains of the crown group amniotes date from the late Carboniferous about 318 million years ago. Of course, determining which Carboniferous vaguely lizard-like animals are actually members of Amniota is an incredibly difficult task, given that their fossils are quite rare and fragmentary. However, the very recent discovery of clawed footprints dating to the early Carboniferous of Australia, circa 358 to 354 million years ago, have shown that amniotes originated much earlier than previously thought, with the tracks possibly belonging to a basal sauropsid, the group that would later produce the modern reptiles and birds. This indicates that amniotes probably first appeared during the latest Devonian, close to the Carboniferous boundary. The common ancestor in question likely resembled the controversial genus Westlothiana, with the development of the amniote egg occurring in very small animals, measuring just 20 centimetres long or less. Another group with controversial relationships that may or may not be early amniotes were the diadectomorphs, a lineage that first appeared in the late Carboniferous and produced the first fully large terrestrial herbivores in Earth's history. However, the most basal members of this clade were carnivores, as represented by the genus Limnoskelis, native to the western United States and straddling the Carboniferous Permian boundary between 306 and 299 million years ago. This relatively large 2 metre or roughly 7 foot long predator would have looked a bit like a smooth skinned crocodile, with a low slung body that possessed a mixture of basal amphibian like and more derived reptile like traits. Its skull was rectangular in shape with sharp pointed teeth and a notable overbite. Originally interpreted as a semi-aquatic ambush predator, more recent studies have found Limnoskelis to have been more terrestrial, possibly living a bit like a large monitor lizard. This animal, as well as the more derived diadectomorphs, only appeared after the so-called Carboniferous rainforest collapse, clearly being well placed for life in drier, less forested conditions. In fact, this lineage really took off in the early Permian, after many Temnus bondal groups had been devastated by the extinction event. The genus Sayajaya, also from Western North America, represents something of a transitional form, probably being a generalized omnivore or herbivore, measuring one meter or about three feet long, 
This stocky animal would have somewhat resembled a large iguana, with a pointed skull and blunt conical teeth, which were probably utilised for stripping vegetation, and maybe consuming the occasional smaller animal. The most diverse and long-lasting of the diadectomorphs were the family Diadectidae, which were also the most massive members of the whole clade, being both the first herbivorous tetrapods and also the first fully terrestrial animals to attain large sizes. Diadectids would have generally resembled large, wide-bodied lizards, with barrel-shaped bodies and relatively short yet robust limbs. Their skulls were quite boxy, with deep, blunt snouts and heterodont teeth well adapted for shredding tough plant material. The family seemed to have originated in the late Carboniferous, although possible fragmentary remains datable to the early Carboniferous have also been found. Basal forms such as Orobates from the early Permian of Germany were quite small, weighing just 4 kilograms, and possessed a fairly elongated body and tail, as well as short legs. Studies of its locomotion have shown that it moved in a semi-erect stance, similar to modern crocodilians, with a slight side-to-side -side motion. More derived forms, such as Diasporactus from the early Permian of New Mexico, were notably larger and bulkier, measuring about 1.3 metres long, with a short blunt skull and peg-like teeth. The feet were proportionally large and strong, with the animal being a proficient, albeit slow-moving walker, with its size probably being enough of a deterrent to early predatory amniotes, such as the Varanopids. By far the best known member of the family was the genus Diadectes itself, present across the United States and Europe between 290 and 272 million years ago, being the largest and among the most derived diadectids. Producing up to six species, this 3 metre or 10 foot long genus was a heavily built chunky animal, with a thick boned skull, heavy vertebrae and ribs, massive limb girdles and short robust limbs. Like all diadectomorphs, it possessed a strange mixture of basal and derived traits, such as a large optic notch, which is a feature found in all labyrinthodonts but not in reptiles, also possessing an ossified tympanum. At the same time, its teeth show advanced specialisations for a herbivorous diet that are not found in any other early Permian animal. It also had a partial secondary palate, which meant that it could chew its food and breathe at the same time, as modern mammals can. Despite their somewhat stumpy appearance, fossil trackways suggest that this animal walked with an almost erect posture. Not a bad feat for an early Permian genus. Diadectes was one of the youngest diadectomorphs, although it wasn't the last, with that honour at the moment going to the Chinese genus Alveustectes, which is about 16 million years younger than all other forms. It lived during the late Permian, roughly 256 million years ago, and is the only diadectomorph known from Asia. Compared to Diadectes, it was quite small at just over one metre long, with the animal's survival possibly being related to the somewhat isolated nature of northern China during the late Permian, therefore not having to compete with the now common herbivorous synapsids and pariasaurs. This may also explain the eventual extinction of the diadectids. While pioneers in their early adoption of terrestrial herbivorous niches, the Permian saw many other big herbivorous land animals emerge, with the diadectids perhaps struggling to compete with them in the long run. As regards their relationships, it was once thought that these animals were the sister group to the amniotes, with their reproduction probably being more like those of modern amphibians, which show very diverse parenting and birthing strategies. However, more recent studies based on their inner ear anatomy have found that diadectomorphs may have been true amniotes after all, often coming out as close relatives of the synapsid proto-mammals. If this turns out to be correct, then they almost certainly laid watertight eggs in terrestrial settings, being some of the first amniotes to do so, representing yet another pioneering step taken by these somewhat comical looking animals. Thanks for watching everyone. As it's currently Pride Month, I thought that for the next episode I'd cover the fascinating and enigmatic Baron Franz Nopska, a forgotten gay icon of paleontology, whose theories about dinosaur ecology and behaviour have aged surprisingly well given that he lived a hundred years ago. See you again soon. Cheerio.